Alright, so as we reach the near end of the uh, horror-themed verses that's kind of bleeding over into the next month, uh, it usually at some point we tackle some sort of franchise, uh, and I figured uh, this it, it came down to this or Saw, and uh, this one had a few less movies, so that's what I settled on. So um, if we get to that point uh, in the next year, uh, Saw will probably be the next franchise we go into, but in the meantime... Uh, I kind of just wanted to tackle these in general um, because of the really interesting approach uh, that the whole series kind of takes, which seems obviously played out by the time you get to five movies. Um, but when you go all the way back to, um, what is it, the year 2000 that uh, the first movie came out, um, it, it kind of felt like this really sort of new and fresh thing. It was still kind of... Like in structure, the movie was more or less uh, like any other horror movie, um, but it's the way um, it goes about its concept that really made it stand out in an interesting way, um, and obviously spawned uh, the franchise that it did. Not to say that you know any horror movie won't find some way to make a franchise out of itself. Um, this one in particular, because you kind of always have to keep the ideas coming, even if uh, some of them will seem a, a bit repetitive as we go on. But for the most part, um, you kind of you have to have something to bring to the table when you uh, go into writing one of these. It seems um, writing might seem like a bit of a loose word, but <laughs> uh, but the concepts uh, that they go through. Um, but the thing about because the thing is is you go through and you see all the different things that have been killing young people in horror movies for a while. Um, and you have, you know, anywhere from, like, you know, monsters to the supernatural, um, to just outright slasher movies. This was, um, this was right around the time the Scream trilogy was a really big deal. I think three, Scream 3 and the first Final Destination came out the same year. Um, so this, at the time, was, like, a really sort of new and fresh idea where it's, uh, all that other stuff, um, and now it's people being stalked by death itself, and death's a weapon is pretty much anything and everything in your surroundings, um, and anything, and it's almost like this, like, Final Destination itself has almost become, like, a term, um, for, like, when you think of all the different freak accidents you can get into when you see something mundane, um, and of course, that, I don't know that that started as much until the second movie came around. Um, but the, so the first one almost seems incredibly downplayed by comparison. Um, but it still has some pretty wicked scenes in it also. Uh, so it starts out with the whole uh, setup that we'll see throughout all the movies where um, there's all kinds of different omens around um, before they actually have the sort of premonitions. Um, there's the moment at the very beginning when Alex has that tag on his ba on his bag, uh, and his mom goes to tear it off, and he's like, oh, you know, oh, don't do that, because, like, you know, I'm afraid of flying, and, you know, everything went okay, and, you know, the tag's in on the bag, and his mom just says, fuck your superstition, weirdly, aggressively, <laughs> uh, by just tearing it off anyway, um, regardless of his fears, um, and then there's the whole John Denver thing, um, where they hear that at the airport. Um, I don't know who's responsible for playing John Denver in an airport, but, um, probably death, we come to learn. Um, he becomes a big fan of Dust in the Wind by the time we get to the fifth movie. Uh, <laughs> so, death also has a playlist, apparently, of Doom. So, uh, and we've also got the coincidences going into it also, where, like, um, like, uh, the flight number and his birthday match up, um, there's the, when he's looking at his, um, digital clock as he's going to sleep, when obviously he's going to be on flight 180, and it's 1 o'clock, and the clock seems to be, I can't tell if it's a malfunction, uh, showing 180, or if it's just a really cool transition into the next scene, um, when it's the sign in the airport, but either way, um, it is an omen of sorts. Uh, and then... Yes, eventually he has the premonition that the plane is going to explode, which it eventually does, but only after a few of them have been kicked off the flight and spared death for now until it catches back up to them. Um, I th Something that's really interesting about the series um, that I think... It almost seems like it might be lazy, like too much of a device 
uh, when you look at it on the outside, but then, like, the more you think about it, the more it's like, well, if they did explain it, number one, it probably wouldn't be a very good explanation and would kind of water it down. Um, and also, it's... It, it just kind of go like it would go into a, a totally different thing um, than what they've set up, and they would have probably too much going on. But the fact that, as far as I remember, um, there's not really an explanation for the premonitions and who has them and why. They just happen to random people, uh, whoever's going to end up being our protagonist uh, for whichever movie. Um, and that's just, yeah, that's just something that happens, uh, I suppose. Um, so, uh, and, and but like I was saying, I, I think it's probably better that there's not too much in that, because you see what I mean, where it's like, it could be a whole different um, aspect of the movie that's really not that important. The whole driving force is just that it happens, and the key to the story is everything uh, that plays out. Um, it's a very sort of small factor in the long run, despite the crucial part that it plays. Um, and the interesting thing that I think the first movie does in particular is, uh, the sort of character work, um, how, because you, you'll notice that a lot in franchises where it's like, the first movie will focus on some stuff that kind of makes it a bit more, I struggle to say grounded, but something in that vein. Um, that you might see less and less throughout the franchise, except for the decent sequels that might try to pick it back up, if not to that same extent. Um, but just this sort of human element where it's like... Because you look at movies where, like, um, a bunch of young people are just dying in these horrific ways, uh, and it's like... And, the, and those movies tend to be really passive about it, because that's that's just the genre. That's what comes with the territory. It's like, if you're a young person in this particular genre, you're going to die a violent death, and, you know, you might have a funeral, but that's as pretty much human of a treatment as you're going to get. Um, so it's like, to actually see the aftermath of this stuff happening, and actually have the characters discussing um, death and its whole eminence is something that also kind of felt a bit uh, interesting at the time. Um where it kind of felt like a new thing that the characters actually really thought about that stuff on like a deep emotional level, as deep as the movie's going to get, uh, emotional level, um, and like where that comes from, and e each person's death actually has an impact on the other characters, at least for the most part. Um, and I think one of the interesting ways they show this is all the different reactions that the characters have um, to Alex after the plane explodes where there's some people that are terrified of him because he had that premonition, it seemed, um, that some people don't know whether to believe or not. Um, there's the people that are angry with him. Um, there's the people like Sean William Scott, um, who try to use him as a sort of fortune teller. Um, and there's people like Clear Rivers, uh, the Alley Order character, that kind of sees it as a, almost like a connection between them. She, ha she feels close to him. I, I do think the... Uh, the whole connection between uh, Alex and Claire throughout the movie is a bit forced. Uh, like, I don't know why it's there as much as it is, and it's pretty... It feels pretty empty for the most part when he becomes, like, her savior at the end, and they go in that whole direction, and it's like, suddenly, they're like a thing, but they're kind of... We, there's not really any development to that. It's just kind of like... The writers just assume we figure that, I think. <laughs> Um, so they just go in that direction, but, um, yeah, and then, obviously, the different ways in which the characters start dying. Some are quite simple, uh, like Billy's, uh, simple decapitation by chance, um, but then there's other cases, like, um, uh, Mrs. Luton, the teacher, where it's like, um, throughout the series, you'd have the moments where, um, there's so many different things in the room that could lead to death, and it's like they keep trying to fake you out, and it's like, it could be this thing, but it's not, and then it could be this thing, and it's not, and all that. But it's like, when you go back to the first movie, and you watch, um, Miss Luton's death, um, it's like, everything. <laughs> like, everything happens to her at once that could be a threat in that room. Um... And I think, I, I, almost, I almost maybe prefer that to all of the multiple fake-outs that the later movies would do. Um, but then there's stuff that seems totally out of place. 
And as far as my research is concerned, apparently it's literally because it was going to be basically the concept, and then in the middle of doing it, the makers of the movie were like, I, let's just not do that. But they had already done it up to this point, so it's just still in the movie. And, and that is, um, Todd's death is a lot different compared to the other deaths in the movie, or the series, really. Um, because it's almost like we actually see death moving. Like, we see things move that really shouldn't, like, it doesn't, it's not like an accident. It's like things are moving that aren't supposed to be moving, and then they put themselves back in place as if they're afraid they're going to get caught or something. Like, the toys in Toy Story. Uh, but, um, then, like, after that, the makers were just like, well, let's kind of go the more, you know, accident route. Um, despite the fact that the whole Todd thing has already been done. You'd think they would have at least maybe reshot that or something in a way that um, kind of covered that up. But no, it's just, they just decided to change their minds as they went. And then the rest of the fran the rest of the kills in the franchise were born. Um, even though that stuff would kind of come back in some of the weaker moments of the later movies, but we'll get to that. Um, and... Yeah, so I, I do think sort of the driving force, mainly, apart from, uh, what, like, because the what really creative way are they gonna die thing didn't really come until later. Like, it, it's, it was happening in this movie, like, the whole accidents. Um, probably mainly in, uh, Billy's case is the one where it's like, they go for the surprise factor of how it happens. Um, and the suddenness of it, but... There's still, uh, like, that, that human factor where they're discussing um, death and all that is where it kind of feels a bit stronger than other movies sort of like it, where it didn't feel like it was... It just said, oh, we have a concept. Um, they're going to die by gruesome accidents because death is coming for them, and then they just go on that, and they just go on the gore factor, uh, like, say, the second movie. <laughs> um but, uh, yeah, I mean, there are moments where um, some of the characters don't get as much. Like, obviously, Sean William Scott is here to just kind of be the... This would have been the year, the year right after the first American Pie. Um, so he was just sort of the comedy relief. It's like, you know, hey, will I pass my driving test? And, you know, if I ask that girl out, will she say yes? And you'll notice every other time in the movie he speaks, it's pretty much him calling Carter a dick. But it's, like, the exact same audio every time. Like, he says, Carter, you dick, like, five times to Kerr Smith. Um, and every time, it's, like, it's just sort of the same line 80 yard in. So it's, like, Charlie Scott barely, like, had much to do in this at all um, when you look at it that way. But, um, yeah, and obviously, you know, some of the connections can feel a bit forced. Like, the whole Alex Clear, I guess, relationship is what you'd call that. But, uh, yeah... Um, but there's also some great inclusions here, like, um, the whole Tony Todd character. Um, not just his brilliant casting, um, but the way he can make the most out of it seems like it's... Because he's, like, one of the most, you know, recognizable aspects of the series is that character, Bloodworth the Coroner. Um, but when you add up his screen time in 1, 2, and 5, the ones that he's in, like, you know, physically where we can see him, um, it's... It really doesn't add up to much. It's like maybe, what, five minutes? Um, but he makes, like, such an impression and just really has that... I, I, I don't know... I mean, it makes sense as a coroner um, and the fact that he works in the morgue that he's the one that kind of knows about this and knows the patterns and all that. Um, but because they make him so almost sinister and, like, all-seeing, like he's everywhere, so they do that especially in Five... Um, you do kind of get a sense where I've always kind of wondered if they're going for the whole is he death in some sort of way approach, uh, in some sort of physical form, but they don't really go, they pretty much, by, by the time five comes around, it's almost like they're half playing with that, half saying, nah, he's just a coroner that just knows all this because he works with the dead bodies when they come in, um, but I guess it's also the casting of Tony Todd that makes you, you just automatically associate him with, like, supernatural horror figures, thanks to Candyman, so, um, yeah, uh, so that's, um, like, as far as singling out, uh, the first movie, that's pretty much, um, the extent of that, um, obviously Devon's always a very solid lead and is very convincing in the more, 
um, in regards to Alex's panic and the way that sort of sets up the prototype for all the other protagonists we get uh, throughout the series. Um, so yeah, and it just kind of set the whole ball rolling on this whole thing. So um, I remember vividly. I didn't see it because um, I was still I was still a kid and I was a really squeamish kid. Um, so everything I heard made me stay as far away from Final Destination Two as possible. But I remember vividly when it first came out because every fucking buddy was talking about it and how sick and twisted and gruesome it was. Um, like, before I even saw this movie, I was terrified of it as a squeamish kid. <laughs> so, all the things that I heard. Um, and there is a change in directors here, um, where we started with James Wong, not to be confused with James Wan, another horror, famous horror director, obviously. Um, but uh, now we've switched over to uh, David R. Ellis, who... I can't remember exactly what he'd done up to this point, but um, a few years later he would come to be mainly known as the director of stuff like Snakes on a Plane. Um, so maybe not. Um, so you're gonna, so you kind of see right off from that alone where we may not be as much into the human element thing and the discussion of death thing. Um, it's gonna be about uh, the spectacle of it all. Um, and yeah, that is the approach that they take with, um, the sort of laughable tagline of, uh, you can't cheat death twice, despite the fact that they cheat death many times in the first movie. <laughs> like, I'd say, I would say more than twice, but, but you get it, it's, it's due, you get it, that's the theme. So, um, it go it goes in, and it has this interesting opening during the beginning credits where we see, like, uh, the events of the first movie being discussed on the news, and it's sort of turned into a whole conspiracy theory thing, uh, which is a really nice touch, and sort of the discussions on that. Um, but mainly, they abandon stuff like that and go more for, um, we're going to make the gore and the deaths go as over the top as possible. We're going to really play up the whole death caused by accident sort of thing. Starting with the fact that the movie actually begins with the the whole thing, the first premonition, is a giant traffic accident involving a log truck, which I don't think I have ever, ever, ever been in a vehicle since this movie came out and saw a log truck on the highway and somebody in that vehicle did not mention this movie. <laughs> it's going to happen every single time. Um, I, I would almost throw the word iconic at it at this point. Um, but yes, there is going to be much more of a focus on gore and also the whole omen aspect we were talking about before, where it's like she's starting to see the clues before they even happen. But I mean, at this rate, in the way that it happens, it does feel a bit um, almost cartoonish eventually. Like, there was kind of a creepy aspect to it in the first movie, um, but here they're just like... I mean, maybe they're intentionally trying to have fun with it because that's like, you know... She turns on the radio and Highway to Hell is playing. She looks over in the other car and some kid has two toy cars that he's just hitting together. But it's like the omens stop being creepy and ominous and turn into more like, um, just like when you're walking down the street and see stuff you don't want to see. Like in The 40-Year-Old Virgin, um, after it's revealed that Andy's a virgin, and so when he's walking down the street, he's just, everything he sees is sex-related. That's basically what the omens of the station do are like. You know, like that scene. So, um, but then, yes, yes, eventually, um, the wreck does happen. And it's like, it was, because you could probably say the, I mean, obviously you didn't have anything to compare the first Final Destination to in regards to how gruesome the accidents would be. Um, which may play in part even so, why um, it was so, like, unexpected and effective, uh, just how over-the-top uh, the whole crash sequence goes, and is just the starting point um, for the other kills we're going to see throughout the movie. Um, which, like I said, ma made this movie a huge talking point when it came out. Um, it, so, credit to it for that, I suppose. But, um... It does, you can see, apart from the accidents, how the writing has gotten significantly lazier. There's a lot of recapping the first movie. And if you're really desperate, <laughs> maybe you can reach and say them practically recapping the first movie entirely from beginning to end. Um, could be an homage to, like, older slasher movies or something, like how... 
Silent Night, Dead and Night 2, like, half of that movie is just footage of the first movie. Or, like, how, like, the first uh, four or five Friday the 13th movies are just them recapping the events of the first movie, like, word for word, every single time. Um, if, maybe you can say that, uh, but for the most part, it's basically just talking about the shit that happened in the first movie that we already saw for a lot of it. Um, and ultimately relating the certain events here. So, um... There is, um, this was the point I was talking about where they kind of start with, uh, the building up, um, to all the different things look like they're going to be the cause of death, and then it's just sort of one sort of anticlimactic thing at the last minute that does it. Uh, and I think this apartment scene kind of really sets that off. Um, where we're long past the days of Billy's decapitation or Amanda Dudmer in the first movie getting smacked by the bus, um, now it's the guess which thing is gonna kill them with all the different build-ups. The only problem with that, though, is that it's, and it's a cool idea for, like, you know, building suspense with this concept, but the trouble is, is once we've seen this apartment scene, um, we get, we get the gist of it. So we now know that that's gonna be the way it plays out. Like, when we see you know, one thing looks like it's going to be the cause, we know it's probably not. And if we see the second thing, it's like, uh, that's probably not either. It's not It's not abrupt or anticlimactic enough, that thing they're building up. Um, so, like, it's very quick for you to get the idea of what the trick is, and once you know the trick, um, obviously it's not going to be as effective as it goes on. Um, throw, the whole dentist thing, you can throw that into also, where it's... Uh, so many things in the dentist's office look like they could be the cause of death. Um, but of course, it's what's going on outside the building. Because um, they got to set you up with that false um, sort of sense of relief uh, when his whole dentist visit goes perfectly fine uh, and nothing went wrong. And then he steps outside and is crushed by a pane of glass in front of his traumatized mother. Uh, <laughs> so... Yes, the, uh, the pleasantries in this movie never end. Uh, this whole series never end. Um, and talking about the abrupt deaths also, um, I do feel that they probably could have started that even earlier. Um, with the whole idea of the um, building up, like, all the treacherous stuff, and then it's just, you know, a fire escape through the eye, or a pane of glass, or whatever. Because of what is revealed about Alex and what happened to him between movies... Um, which is, I believe, a highly criticized aspect of at least these first two movies, where it does like I don't I don't really know the story behind that whether um, they couldn't get Devon Sawa back, or if he didn't want to come back, or if they just chose to write him out or what, um, which would be odd since you know Clear plays such a major part in this movie, um, but it's like we we learn in, like, a newspaper clipping that Alex was killed by a falling brick. Of all the different ways he could have died in the first movie, and all the way, all the things he did to prevent it, um, all that build-up, uh, leading to a falling brick, um, which is basically the deaths in this movie in a nutshell, uh, just spread out through an entire movie. Um, but the thing here is that maybe that wouldn't have been so terrible if maybe it was, like, like if you only were going to convince Devin Saul to do it for, like, a limited amount of time, um, maybe make Alex's death the opening scene and Drew Barrymore him, uh, where it's, like, put him on the promotional shit, you know, put his name on the poster and all that, and then just kill him in the opening scene if you had to get rid of Alex so quickly and abruptly. Um, like I said, there's probably other things that went into that. Maybe a contractual thing, maybe a salary thing. It's hard to tell with that stuff when, um, certain people come back and certain people don't. But, um, yeah. So, uh, and, and they, and they start to go into the whole thing of, uh, the, the clues. Um, letting the character with the premonitions know who is going to die and when and how. Um, and, and, and it gets, it gets a bit dumb. Like, the, the movie gets dumber the more it goes into the clues aspect of it. Because, because it's also, I mean, it's, it seems kind of counterproductive to say that this movie's far-fetched in any sense, because, you know, the whole concept is what it is. 
But I mean, you you get a sense where like um when it's when she gets the clue about um the kid with the pane of glass because the pigeons are hitting the window. Um, but she sees the pigeons in her vision, so she says, um, he's gonna be attacked by pigeons. <laughs> and they play it so serious. Like, they, they're they really, really playing it serious. Um, like, the series did eventually start having fun with itself down the line, and I, you could probably say 2 was the start of it, um, but I still don't know... The, the line is still kind of blurred there, um, where it's like, it still feels like they're taking themselves seriously, even when it's getting significantly dumber. Um, and I feel like maybe a more, a, a director with a bit more of a grasp on that, um, would have been able to find that line, and we would know, like, when to laugh and when they're playing it up as genuine suspense. Um, and the seriousness that comes with, he's gonna be attacked by pigeons. <laughs> that whole declaration, um, it doesn't really come through in any positive way. Um, and then the whole, uh, pretty much everything that happens in the elevator in the second movie, where it's, um, where the death that eventually comes after being introduced to this elevator like three times, uh, really just kind of feels like, you know, a different play on Tatum's death and Scream. Um, but still put more graphic. Um, but the thing about this is, what is up with this elevator? Like, it has this, seems to have this weird supernatural way of bringing out the really fucking weird in people for no reason. Comedy relief, maybe? If it was funny, I guess. Um, but it just comes off weird. Um, like the whole moment, uh, the whole scene that's like its own individual scene of the dude trying to get into the elevator and the dude won't hold it, but he makes it just in time, and then he just, like, acts weird towards the guy. Which doesn't amount to anything, and it's its own scene for some reason. Um, I guess to add to this guy's character? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, but then there's the scene that's leading to the decapitation. The... There's gonna be a guy with hooks involved... And it's this guy with a box of prosthetic arms with hooks on them. It's all... Re <laughs> you see where, like, the the reaching is really coming into play here? Even with con a concept like this, there is a breaking point for reaching. Um, and, the, and they get to it by the end of the second movie. Um, before the second movie is even halfway done. Um, but the whole thing about this dude, like... The fact that this dude with hooks is so fucking weird for no reason, like the hair sniffing thing. Why is it? What the fuck is it with this elevator that makes people really fucking weird when they're in it and bother other people? I it's yeah, like I said, I guess it's supposed to be some sort of comedy or something, but I don't know. Um, but yes, uh, then it eventually we play up the whole. Th they try and keep making it more complicated by putting a pregnant woman in, and it's like, oh well, if this then another life might, you know, stop a death from happening, and it gets really fucking convoluted the more it goes, and the more they try to complicate it. Um, like, the most the most complicated it gets in the first movie is you stop, some, you stop the next person in line from dying, then the next person will die. Um, and it may or may not come back around. That's it. It's real, it's simple enough. Um, and adding all these other aspects into it, I guess you could say is trying to use the concept to its fullest by taking in these different routes, which, which some of the other movies do much better, um, but here it feels way too convoluted in the second movie. Um, and then this is eventually leading to, um, a nice anticlimactic death, um, for Clear and, and the other dude. Um, in the explosion, where it's like the movie ran out of ideas so much they started killing their characters more than one at a time. Um, because they were just that out of ideas at this point. Um, but we do eventually get to um, a, a pretty wicked ending. And I may kind of contradict this when we get to a death scene in the fourth movie. But right now, I'll, <laughs> I'll acknowledge um, that it's pretty wicked uh, what they do with Noel Fisher uh, in, this, in these last moments. Um, where he gets saved from death by being pulled out of the way of the van. Um, and we don't really necessarily think about the fact in the moment, because there's so much chaos going on at once, um, that Noah Fisher just cheated death here. Uh, <laughs> so it's going to eventually come back to him also. 
um, in this final scene, where it's, a, it's the classic horror movie moment where everything seems fine, and then there's just one more payoff, and um, quite a payoff it is, so, so props to them for that, um, for that little sick and twisted payoff. Um, so that will take us pretty much into uh, the third movie, where we uh, James Wong comes back from the first movie to direct this one. Um, so you can kind of sense a bit of a shift in regards to the character work in this one comes back, which seems to fall. I mean, you, you can focus this on the writers, obviously, um, but it really seems to follow Wong when the character work is strong in this series um, between these two movies. Um, and so by now... We've had the plane sequence in the first movie, and we had the traffic accident. So, um, the accident in the second movie has now become so notorious, it's now become a novelty of the franchise. Of not just, you know, all the different ways people are going to die, but what's going to be the initial accident is now one of the big things leading into each movie now that people want to know when they're going into a new one. Um... And sure enough, the advertising put it out there pretty quickly so that everybody get, could get all hyped about a roller coaster accident. <laughs> um, and uh, worth noting, many of the things in these movies is stuff I tend to not partake in. Um, you won't see me on a roller coaster, most likely. You won't see me on a plane, most likely. Um, and so that's, yes, only further reinforcing my own fears while they're at it. Um, so. Uh, what's what I another thing that I think kind of stands out, and you can tell there's kind of a shift on the different focuses here is um, while the roller coaster accident is pretty um, you know wild uh, and it's a wild idea in general, um, I like that there's not necessarily as much of a gore focus necessarily um, in it. Like when you think of it, it's like it seems perfect to have something as you know wicked and gruesome as the accident in the second movie. Um, but not necessarily, not really, necessarily. Um, I think it also probably has a lot to do with the, uh, embracing more and more as the series went on of CGI. Um, so they're gonna look a lot faker as they go also. Um, but, um, they do, uh, ha play with some new stuff in this one, uh, once that passes. That works and is, is probably a better example of expanding on the concept than the stuff we saw in the second movie. Um, where we're, we talk about the omens uh, that they see leading up to it, and this one literally starts to borrow from the omen, like the movie, where uh, we saw, where they had the character of the photographer, and we saw the different, you know, illusions to people's deaths uh, as we saw the in, in the different pictures. Um, and, and yeah, they did sort of take a bit of a, um, a famous, probably, misstep in, for whatever reason, they decided to bring 9-11 into this, <laughs> um, which, which really sticks out in a really weird way. Um, sort of the same way, similarly, after the tanning bed girls die, and they're at the funeral, and the guy's freaking out, and he's saying, like, you know, why did they deserve to die? You know, Charlie Manson and Osama Bin Laden are still alive, and they're dead. And it's like, well, that's an interesting scene now. Um, he's going to need a better argument these days. But um, even so, um, I do think this one succeeds a lot more in that sort of having fun with it aspect. Where, like I said, the first one more or less plays it pretty straight. The second one is uneven to the point where you can't even quite tell when it's trying to have fun and when it's just kind of bad. Um, but this, this one is, makes it pretty clear, uh, when it's having fun with itself. Um, particularly with, um, the, the way they play with the concept of the pictures themselves, when we see, um, all the different possibilities of, like, you know, when you look at the picture, it's, it's like, is this thing the omen? Is that thing the omen? Which is it? Is it even this picture? And, like, they, they throw you off later where it's like, oh, shit, it's not this picture we should have been examining. Um, and that that kind of stuff um, is really cool. And the kind of really kind of keeps you on your feet despite the fact that we've seen the whole different ways they've tried this before of saying, oh, it could be this thing or this thing. Um, but the building that up before the scene itself, um, I think, kind of adds something a little more to it. 
Um, and then you just get scenes like the scene in the gym um, where there's like so much happening at once where it's like like the apartment scene in the second movie it's just one guy alone and it's like all this different stuff that could be happening but in like this gym scene there's like a lot of people here and a lot of pandemonium all at once and it's like there's so much chaos you're hardly even thinking about is it this thing or is it this thing it's just like you can just feel the building tension until the payoff comes. It's like you're hardly even anticipating something at that point. You just, Like something in particular. You're just anticipating something. It's like by the time it all happens, it could be anything. Um, and then it, like, the when it just, it's just one, you know, gruesome, swift little payoff like that. Um, then it's like, that. I think that's kind of the stuff. Um, that they were trying to accomplish in the second movie, that they eventually um, found footing on in this one. Um, and it also comes back to them having, you know, the the genuine talks about death. There's actually, like, a real chilling moment um, when they're at the cemetery, and Mary Elizabeth Winstead, who is also um, a really good lead like Devon's Hall was, um, where she has a line where it's like... Um, I'm probably paraphrasing, but it's something like she never she never really feels so much like there's nothing after death than when she's in a cemetery. Uh, and there's just something about that line that's like really eerie and chilling that really works for me. So, um, but they but they do find a balance of this where you can tell they're kind of almost throwing almost borderline parody into this as well with like the like the tanning bed girls. Um, where they almost seem like they're really playing up the types of characters that they are, where it's not necessarily just they made a shallow characterization because they're lazy writers, but it's like, that's that's kind of the point. Um, and they still manage to do funny stuff with that, like um, when they offer Mary Elizabeth Winstead to come tanning with them when everybody else considers her an outcast because of the premonition, and when they walk away you hear them say, oh my god, that was so nice of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the fact that they're that shallow like is the whole basically joke of it um is what actually ends up making it work and like by the time it goes by the time they get to the tanning beds it goes into full campy territory you've got the nudity you've got the really on the nose song um and it's like you can tell what they're doing at this point um and it kind of like going into a campy level the fact that they were able to find the transition to that point ends up making it work in the long run. Um, so I think that's where this one like really succeeds. Um, and then, um, like I was talking about, where the second movie really tended to rely on the first movie, it seemed, um, and any of its new ideas seemed convoluted. This is taking a different approach now, where, and it's something we would see uh, when Five comes back around, um, where it's, they introduce that it's not necessarily just the whole freak accident thing that could be a threat here. It could eventually work its way in that the other people in the group start to become the threat. Um, when one of them gets vengeful after the, uh, gruesome nail gun accident, um, and then that could end up being one of the character's deaths is through another one of them, um... And I thought, I always thought that was a real... That, that's another one that seems like it could be a bit of a lazy approach because then it just kind of becomes, you know, any other thriller. Um, but to work it into this concept without abandoning the concept um, is where I really think this was a, a pretty good idea in the long run. Because um, the concept, regardless of injecting that into the concept, the concept, the concept itself always comes back around <laughs> uh, in really big ways. Um, especially for that particular person that becomes the threat. Um, so yeah, I really liked the sort of new stuff they did with that, and the way they were able to bring some of the stronger points um, from the first movie and put them back into this one without necessarily doing the same thing all the time. Um, so I thought that was nicely handled. And then, of course, we do have another appearance from Tony Todd in this a couple of times. Um, where I think he, he's the voice on the roller coaster and he's the voice on the train. Another thing that I think alludes to the fact that maybe he's not just the coroner, you know? Uh, <laughs> so, um, and, you know, the end credit song being Love Train is just, uh, 
Bravo. Like, we say it's on the nose uh, when they're playing Love Roller Coaster in the tanning beds, but I mean, um, I, sometimes it's just a commendable, <laughs> commendable addition. Um, so, yeah. Three, Final Station 3 is one of those movies that I never remember how much I like it uh, until I'm, like, talking about it or thinking about it or, or go back to it. But, uh, yeah, it's really well done. So, um, yeah. Uh, and then the, the fourth movie, where we go back to David R. Ellis, the director of the second movie. And once again, much like when we returned to James Wong from the first movie, you can tell when the director has changed, and you can tell which director from which movie it is. <laughs> so, um, and of course, uh, The Final Destination, because I think for a split second, they thought, or they wanted us to believe this was going to be the last one. <laughs> which I'm sure nobody believed, but, um, and of course it came out in 2009, when we were right before Avatar, and everybody wanted to jump on the 3D thing. Um, especially horror movies. So, this was an addition to that. And of course, when you talk about um, how I said they were going to be embracing CGI, which you can particularly see during the roller coaster accident, um, you can the gore is going to look significantly faker. And when you add in the 3D effect, um, that's going to be tenfold. Um, so, so people that were maybe put off by the gore or squeamish or whatever um, might be it, the Final Destination might be much more easier on them since everything looks so incredibly fake. Um, so and it's like and not not even like um, well every now and then there's something that seems practical like the aftermath of the tire just before it cuts to the title, um, but for the most part um, it's pretty. Uh, yeah, there's a point in time during the premonition when one of the characters, it might be the main character, is impaled, and it's like, the the impalement itself almost doesn't seem like it's attached to them <laughs> when we see it. Um, and they're really playing up the whole 3D thing um, of the shit and the gore going at the camera and all that. Um, which obviously is just going to look very, you know, CGI and very fake, thus uh, not particularly effective. Um, and, and also to the point that there's even some of the visions, where, like, in the other movies it's sort of, like, flashes and all that, but the visions in this one just go full animated. Like, when he sees the snake that's, uh, alluding to the ambulance that kills, uh, Michael T. Williamson. Yeah, just full-on animation. <laughs> so, um, I don't, I don't know how you want to take that, but, um, it does lead to, um, a pretty nice, uh, opening credit sequence of, um, like, the X-ray versions of the deaths throughout the previous deaths in the franchise. That's a pretty, um, cool addition, but, uh, yeah, but that's not to say that the movie doesn't have some interesting things going on. Only trouble is I can't tell if they're on purpose or not. <laughs> like, um, like, one of the first major deaths in it is the racist. Um, who's pissed off at Michael T. Williamson because he was, um, uh, the guard that supposedly caused the death of his girlfriend or wife or whoever she was. Um, but of course, you know, he's a flat-out racist, so he's going to go to Michael T. Williamson's house and set a giant wooden cross on fire. <laughs> so something that, territory, I don't know if anybody expected to show up in a Final Destination movie, but here we are. Running really low in the character mill here, so let's get down into the deep racists and bring them here, and that's where we are. Um, but the interesting thing, though, that like I said, I can't tell if, you know, the movie's entirely doing intentionally, is um, fading the line now between um, death making these elaborate accidents happening and just flat-out karma. <laughs> uh, given what happens here with the whole, the whole irony that he's the one that ends up on fire... They're once again playing with songs with Why Can't We Be Friends, playing on the radio as he burns to death, um, trying to commit a severely racist act. Uh, yeah, so it's like, I almost feel like there's something clever in there. Uh, the whole, is it even death anymore, or is it just flat-out karma <laughs> in some cases? Um, but this is only, this is only really explored in this one scene, so there you go. Um, and then it gets more into... Um, 
the other, the how elaborate can we make the deaths? Um, some of them are pretty wicked. The pool death um, is pretty wild. Like, that's, you know, props to them for that. <laughs> but there's also stuff like, um, I think, particular, I think it's the beauty salon um, where you kind of get this vibe, where it kind of goes back to what we were talking about with Todd's death in the first movie. Um, where it's like, it's it's almost like we can actually see death acting and stuff's moving that's not really supposed to be moving. Or stuff to where it's like, it's moving only because the writers are really, really fucking reaching. <laughs> um, so we so we do get back to that territory at some point. Um, but, yeah, there's but there's nothing really interesting they do as far as, like, the characters go. Um, like... Like, when we had the, you know, turning points in 3, where, like, you know, a certain character became one of the threats, and, you know, the whole discussing, like, philosophically, the whole death thing, um, this movie's not gonna have any of that. This movie's pretty much just a straight-up slasher movie without the slasher, you know, physically there. Um, and it's, and yeah, we're basically just waiting for all of them to die. Like, this is, I, uh, of the franchise, this is the one, easily, that has the least amount of thought put into it, which mainly seems to focus on the fact that they really just wanted to do the 3D thing. Um, you can also tell they ran out of ideas because it's easily the shortest movie. It's an hour and 20 minutes. That's it. All the others, at least, passed an hour and a half, even if by, like, maybe a minute or two. Um, but this one couldn't even get close to the hour and a half mark. Uh, because, <laughs> because there were that many, there was just that l lack of an idea. It was all about the gore and the kills, and then that's all they really had to offer. Um, so you get stuff like, um, the cork, uh, that they pop when they think they're all saved, flying towards the camera. <laughs> and then the whole thing where, after a while, it, it almost starts to feel like an advertisement for 3D, where there's the whole segment at the end where they go to a 3D theater and make a huge deal out of the fact that it's 3D. And then it just becomes that. Um, and then it's... And, yeah, and then it also... Um, like I was talking about with the second movie, it really starts to become rushed. Uh, where Mike, the Michael T. Williamson character, where we have all that build-up um, of, like, he tries to kill himself and he just can't do it. Um, we know he, t he talks to his mom on the phone. He's an Alcoholics Anonymous. All this different stuff. There's so much surrounding his character. And then they get to celebrate when he got that close to killing himself, and it's like, oh, well, it wasn't me after all that was supposed to die and all that. Um, and then just... Just an ambulance. And you could think that's that's effective because they built him up that much and then he dies so abruptly, but it really just feels like they're rehashing the bus death in the first movie, doesn't it? And that's all. That's all. They, We've already felt that before. Um, that, you know, sudden burst of, oh, somebody got hit by a car or any sort of vehicle, and it's... Yeah, so it's it's all been there and gone. Um, and as far as the movie um, having fun with itself, obviously we talked about the way three was able to draw the line between when it was be when it was taking itself seriously and when it was being super campy. But there was a clear distinction when they were doing which one, which made it work. Um, and in this one, um, there are times when they want to go the route of say the Noah Fisher death in the second movie where I commended it for being so sick and twisted, where he blows up and his arm lands in front of his mom at the picnic table. And the final shot of the movie is her screaming her child's name, who is now in pieces all over the place at this family picnic. So there's almost something commendably twisted about that. Um, and this one does something similar, yet somehow leaves an awful taste in my mouth. I don't know if it's because the roles are reversed or what, You'd almost think it'd be worse in the second... I don't know, but... I guess that's debatable, but... The scene where, um... Chris Allen, I think is her name, uh, the elevator girl in Liar Liar, <laughs> is the mother, um, who puts tampons in her kids' ears. The, at the beauty salon, um, gets the rock through the eye after all that build-up. Just another whole play on the apartment scene. The whole, oh, it's all this, it could be this, it could be this... And the rock that, of course, we know is going to be in it because they set it up at the very beginning of the scene before she even walks in there. Um, and then they play it up, the horror that the, she says, I've got my eye on you to her kids. And then the rock goes through her eye. 
kills her instantly while her two young children are screaming. And it's like, for some reason, the exploding barbecue in two is okay. <laughs> but for another reason, I guess this is self criticism in the moment i don't know but for, there's just something about the moment in this one that just doesn't i i don't know i don't know if it's because it's trying to do it and i don't i don't even know i think it's because in the second one they know it's like a it's a real you know sick and twisted sense of humor thing but it's almost like they're trying to do that on top of the camp factor like having her literally say i've got my eye on you too is like a whole i, I don't know Almost like it makes it worse. And it's like, um, I guess, as far as having children screaming about their dead mother um, dying graphically right before their eyes, is sort of that fashion of people could commend it for going there. I don't know. It just leaves a horrible taste in my mouth in a way that, for some reason, the exploding barbecue didn't. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 the exploding barbecue probably does, to an extent, leave a bad taste in my mouth, but still, it's like... Maybe it's also because it's the note the movie goes out on, um, is what adds the impact to that. Um, whereas this is just right here in the middle of the movie, and just doing the same thing over again, but I guess to a worse degree, so... Yeah, um, it, yeah it's, it may, maybe it's also... It's just too goofy, also... Um, to do something that, like, like, it's, it feels, by that point in the movie, when we've reached the full-on goofiness level, I think is where there's just not a balance here, but, yeah, so, or maybe I just get too stuck on that, that could be too. Um, but, yeah, you talk about, like, the CGI and the fakeness and them doing the whole 3D thing, making it just not near as effective when the kills happen, um, like, I was talking about there was still practical gore here and there, like, with the tire, and there's also, um, the escalator one always kind of stood out to me, too. Escalator's another thing I don't fucking do. Um, you better have, like, a set of stairs somewhere, otherwise I'm not getting to that second or third floor or wherever it is. <laughs> um, and, yeah, so, yeah, and that's, that's pretty vicious. Um, and so it's like, that's, that's a case where it's like, you know you commend them for the viciousness of it. Um, especially since it just ends up being another premonition anyway. Um, yeah, and it, and it kind of makes up for them, for it feeling like they were starting to half-ass it there for a while, pre the explosion, um, with the footage of the longest goodnight of all things that they just added generic audio to. Um, because they needed a movie with a huge explosion, and that movie's got one. Um... But, uh, yeah, so it's almost like they just sort of made up for them rushing, you know, Michael T. Williams' death and all that. And so they put a, a bit more here at the very end, but, um, for the most part, the movie is just sort of underwhelming in comparison. With, even even when you look at the second movie, as convoluted as it was, um, there was still a certain effectiveness um, to, like, the kills and their impact and all that. One I didn't mention in two that I also think is pretty wicked is the airbag. Uh, so, stuff like that. Stuff that's, like, you know, irony 101, but still is still a great payoff. Um, yeah, so, I, so yeah, I, a bunch of scattered thoughts on the fourth movie. There's things that I like about it, um, but for the most part, it's, it's easily, like, the laziest of the bunch. So, yeah. Um, so then we get to five. Um, the, the first, the first one in the franchise that like, even the critics, uh, kind of went to. Like, the, the first one, uh, got some positive attention. Uh, like, I think Ebert liked it. Um, but when we got to five, um, people seemed to be much more open to it. And that, that's probably, that's probably a lot to do with comparing it to the fourth movie. Um, but yeah, the, we do go in some interesting directions with five also. And it's also kind of a case of what three did. Um, where we take some aspects of s some of the other movies... And we kind of take them in different directions and try to expand a little bit more. And do something a little bit more than just the routine stuff that's in, say, like, 2 and 4. But we've got a different director entirely now from where we bounced around between um, 1 and 3 and 2 and 4 um, is Stephen Quayle, who is, interestingly enough, a frequent collaborator of James Cameron. 
So, um, like, he did that um, Aliens in the Abyss documentary with him, and then he was, like, a, what was it, like a second unit director on Titanic and Avatar. So, um, it seems a lot more trustworthy uh, now that we're two years post-Avatar and we've got somebody who's worked with Cameron multiple times. Um, this was a movie that was, like, made for 3D. Uh, there was, like, no conversion. And it wasn't necessarily just, you know, a trend like the fourth movie was using it as. Um, so, and the 3D was actually one of the things that was praised about it. Um, I didn't see it in that fashion, but, um, I, that's, the, like, the reviews themselves, like, the critical reviews actually praised the 3D in it. So, um, there is that. Um, but we do have another, um, sort of bland lead, like we did in the fourth movie, uh, Sam, who's played by, um, Nicholas, um, Augusto, I think his name is, he was, um... Larry Fouch in Election, uh, the the other pain in Matthew Broderick's ass in Election. <laughs> um, and he's here with his buddy, uh, not Dave Franco, but might as well be. Um, and they all work together, and now it is a bridge collapse on a bus. Um, another one where it's like, okay, yeah, you could definitely do something uh, with this setup. Um, the NASCAR race, or I guess just the race car race, in the fourth movie is a nice idea, but it does feel a bit reminiscent of... We already had crashing cars before. Um, and we're going to have a lot here, too, but a bridge collapse is kind of a whole different uh, scenario. So, um, we do have um, other characters here, but it, it is one of those cases, something I forgot to mention, uh, that they kind of tried to keep doing, was um, the whole idea of the characters having the last names of, like, you know recognizable name, like, iconic names in the horror genre in general, um, that we saw throughout, and, like, really going kind of in there, too, like, not just the usual names, like, um, like, I think there, there's, like, a Carpenter in, you know, Final Destination 2, there, they were much more there, um, and I think a Corman, um, but, uh, the first movie had stuff, like, um, there was, um, Chaney was a man of Detmer, um, Alex Browning is, after Todd Browning, of all people, uh, the Bella goes he's Dracula and freaks Todd Browning. Um, and this one, um, goes into some also, like, who, who, there's a Hoover, there's, um, I think Not Dave Franco is a Friedkin, of which is an interesting choice. Um, and, th and they're all scattered around, there's a castle in this one. Um, but in this case, it started off as, like, a really cool detail in the first movie. Then the second one half-assedly tried it. And then this one... I like some of the callbacks that they did. Um, there's a lot in, but, um, but the thing about that, though, is that in this movie, it feels more like that's really the only way we're going to remember the characters' names. <laughs> um, because otherwise, um, there are just other characters here who are put here to die, more or less. Um, but... They, but they still do um, some things here that we'll get into. But for the for starters, we do have stuff like them being on the road um, before they get to the bridge, and they pass a log truck, which kind of just feels like, you know, fan service. We've gotten far enough into the Final Destination franchise that we can do fan service now, and this movie is going to do that. Um, and uh, But we do have stuff where uh, we bring Tony Todd back, um, and was sort of like, he, there, it seems like they're trying to make up for, uh, there was a lot of criticism for how little there was of him and how wasted he was in the second movie. Um, so the way he kind of just keeps popping up and sort of gives you that whole, he's kind of always lurking around feeling. Um, I, like, I, I still wish he's a character they did more with, but nevertheless, um, just his presence alone does still work. Um, and this one does inject humor into it. Um, which is interesting because they're not necessarily, the humor doesn't necessarily just come from, you know, them trying to bounce back and forth between, you know, being serious and being borderline parody. Um, but just some genuinely funny moments between the characters, like, um, uh, Peter Burton's character, Isaac. Um, there's like a running joke where David Koechner plays their boss, and he keeps thinking that Isaac is already dead. <laughs> when he's not. He's going through all the different names of the people that died in the accident at the funeral. And he says Isaac's name while Isaac's right there in the crowd. Um, and then it happens again when Isaac's addressed and he's like, wait, he, who's that? I, I didn't know he was alive. <laughs> so that's kind of a funny running joke throughout. And they do some stuff like that. 
Um, but as far as like character work goes, even though I said that the character names aren't that memorable and most of them are here just to basically die, the way they hand, and I did say he was a bit bland earlier, and he is, like the, like the acting in this movie is bad for the most part, um, which makes the character seem bland, but if you look at it from like a writing standpoint, um, they do do some nice development here where the other movies weren't. I think it's mainly in comparison to some of the other movies. Um, where this is one of the rare cases in this series where we don't immediately jump right into the next death after the main event at the beginning has happened. Um, so we get this whole thing when um, he we get like his whole background of wanting to be a chef and all that, and he's at this restaurant. and we, So we get this whole scene of like, you know, his food gets sent back and the customer's pissed off, but then the chef that's there with him, like, defends his food and all that. And it's like, that's, there's like a nice character moment there where, like, he does really have it. And he's having to have, he works with people that are willing to back him up and there's like a whole thing there. It never comes back. There's not much point to it. Um, but it's nice to, like, build up the characters a little bit in ways like this. Um, and, like, them as a couple, also later when they talk about going to Paris and all that. Just kind of cleverly putting that right back in there before you realize exactly how far they're taking the Paris thing. Um, which seems just so stupidly obvious when you watch it back. But that first time around, uh, it just kind of slipped by most people. Um, but uh, yeah, once we get through some of that character work with the main two characters here, the couple. Um, yeah, it is time for the deaths. And... As far as them starting with uh, the one with the gymnast, um, I do think there is a factor here where it's like, it's it's interesting that they went really far-fetched, yet somehow didn't go like, like it's not necessarily over-the-top kind of far-fetched. Um, where when you think, far, in this series anyway, when you think far-fetched, you think... Like I said, there's only so far-fetched you can be with the concept itself, but I mean, with all the elaborate shit that happens here, um, the fact that she dies simply by slamming her body against the ground in the wrong way, um, is like, it, it's a far-fetched thing even by this series' standards. But it does kind of have a, have a nice bit of punctuation on that, where um, when you kind of get over of, how does that even happen? And it's like, not, not even necessarily in like a freaky way or a surprising way, just like, how does that happen? <laughs> but the follow-up scene to that, when the cops are here, and Courtney B. Vance is here, um, and they're discussing it, and there's kind of a nice payoff to that by um, Courtney B. Vance saying, all right, lay out for me what happened. And the guy's just like, I can't. It's like, I, if I tried to replicate this a hundred times, I could not show you what the fuck happened. <laughs> so like, I think that's, that's kind of a cool way to do that also, to where it's like, it's so just weirdly far-fetched and unlikely. Um, but then when you see the... It, there is actually... It sort of brings a creepy factor back. When the cops are looking at it like, I don't know how that shit happened. But there's like no way this could have happened. Uh, and it's like, that's, that's actually kind of cool once it gets past the whole, well, yeah, that wouldn't happen. Uh, that cop scene, I think, kind of takes that, that one further step and kind of brings it back to probably where they want to be and what makes the death more effective. So, yeah. Um, and then um, there's this wicked scene um, with um, PJ Byrne at the massage parlor. And you it's almost kind of surprising that it took acupuncture five movies to get into this series. <laughs> uh, but here we are. Um, but I think what makes it so wicked is it seems like it would be so obvious that acupuncture would eventually lead to a Final Destination death. But it's the fact that it's not the death itself. The acupuncture and the effects of the needles going inside him is just the start of this. Like, he's being practically tortured through this. It's not him being teased with, like, oh, this might be your death or this might be your death. It goes back to what happened to Miss Luton in the first movie and all the shit's happening to him. Um, and then the Buddha is just the final payoff. Um... So, yeah, I do think that works um, a lot more uh, when you have the different sort of things going on. Um, and then you get to uh, the, um, the eye surgery scene, which, like many of the death scenes in this movie, in these movies, um, it always kind of feels like there's a bit of a rehash of a previous one. 
Um, and when she's, you know, there doing the whole eye thing, we are getting, you know, flashbacks to the dentist's office in the second movie. And because of that, we kind of know, like, well, what, because we know the whole series at this point, um, oh yeah, well, we, you know, know this, it's going to be a whole bunch of stuff that seems like it's going to be, but it's going to be something mundane or whatever. Um, but this is kind of a scene where it's like, they do something interesting with the characters where it's like, it's not necessarily that we care about the character in a sense of, oh, we know, you know, her whole backstory and we've come to care for her because she's such a well-thought-out character. It's just this one detail they throw in, which, all, I mean, all this, it's here to eventually lead to her death, of course. Um, but the moment when she walks in and she sees the stuffed animals and they're like, you know, oh, that's here for the children. Or the adults, if you want and it's just the fact that she did, like, choose a bear to, like, hold on to during this. It's, like, it's just that alone is, like, oh, no, don't kill this character. You can't you can't have her grasping a teddy bear in fear and then kill this character. Are you that heartless? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and forget heartless eventually. We're going to be eyeless. So, um, yeah, the bear's basically there to not only, you know, foreshadow her death, but ultimately cause it as well. Uh, so, yeah, um, and then, like I said, it does go back into the territory of the people become the threat, where they add in this whole thing where they finally, like, the characters acknowledge, you know, if a death, you know, if we can trade deaths here and some other death can save me, uh, then I'll just kill, uh, <laughs> it's like, if you just kill somebody, then you could do that, and it's like, the way they use that to make, uh, the characters be threats to each other um, it's kind of a new and interesting development here. Um, like I said, would probably be much better executed if the acting wasn't so terrible for the most part. But, um, yeah, still kind of works, um, as far as progressing the story and making it feel a bit... It, it could still feel like a rehash of the stuff that was going on in 3, but, um, the different angle they go about it and the reasoning for where it comes from, the motivation of it, um, it's still, you know... Oh, you know, the girl I was in love with died, so now I'm coming after these people for some sort of weird vengeance or whatever. It's still the same thing there, um, but the whole idea of the characters being aware of if they kill somebody that could take their place um, adds a whole sort of motivation to that character and makes that character even more threatening. Um, so, yeah, on paper, that works. Um... So, eventually, we talk about how we've been in so many different uh, directions and variations and all that, and we're kind of getting to know the magic tricks as they come, and know the if this thing probably actually means this thing, and this thing's probably just a fake out so that this thing can happen. So, and it always comes down to, it, like, every single one, all four of these have the same ending, of, oh, we figured it out. Oh, we cheated death. Oh, everything's great now. Death. So it's like, if that absolutely, positively must be the way this movie ends, you gotta do something else to make it surprising in some way. So we went the surprise prequel way, um, which Saul would later do as well. Um, and that's another thing where I remember, um, the very widespread reaction to this twist. And it's one of those ones that you can go back and kind of see that it more or less does add up. Uh, but what I really like about the way it adds up in particular is the way they put stuff in, um, that you don't really realize till you go back, um, where it's like, um... Like, nobody's doing the talking about the events of Flight 180 like they were doing throughout the other movies, because it obviously hasn't happened yet. Um, has, not only has that not happened, hasn't happened to a couple of the characters. Um, but then there's also stuff like when they see the log truck at the beginning, and it's like, nobody panics, because pre-Final Destination 2, it's just a log truck. Or there is a moment where I am pretty sure um, when the girl with the eye, um, has the omen of the broken picture. The picture is her, I'm pretty sure, at the roller coaster that's in three. Um, but it's like, 
oh yeah, that roller coaster would be a thing because the accident, you know, had not happened yet, and nobody's going to bring that up at all. Like, the clues are there of stuff that was in the previous movies, but nobody said when those things came up if they were before or after. <laughs> um, so, and the way they kind of set it in your mind that you're not really going the prequel route unless you were able to piece together the Paris thing or really... Um, when you have that stuff in your mind, like the log truck and the picture with the roller coaster, at the roller coaster, um, it's like in your mind, it's like, yep, that's the stuff that happened before. And that's it. That's all you're thinking of. You're always associating, you see that stuff, but you're always associating it with being a before. So your mind's not even necessarily going in the direction that we ultimately end up in. Um, so... I really like uh, the way all of that turned out. So, um, I think that's, uh, yeah. Oh, and then, um, also talking about, um, Tony Todd going up to them and saying, like, when he says, you know, how do you know all this? And Tony Todd says, because I've seen this shit before. And in your mind, the first viewing, you're like, yeah, he's seen it before in the other movies. Because he was there. We saw him there. But I like the way this sets it up, because if we went in knowing this was a prequel, um, they could have done something lame, like set it up as this was the first known example of the whole premonition thing and death coming back for them and all that. But now that we know that Tony Todd says, I've seen this shit before, before any of these movies, our minds can just say this goes so far, this could go back to the beginning of time, this kind of thing happening. Uh, which is really cool and like really ominous and eerie. So, um, uh, so all that I think I love the way it kind of all adds up. Um, so, and isn't necessarily just some sort of lazy twist. Um, like I'm trying, to, I was trying to think if there was even like a a technology continuity error, but nothing that springs to mind immediately. Of course, details like that are going to be vague anyway. So, like in memory, so. Yeah, um, so that's pretty much uh, what this whole series uh, amounted to. Um, so yeah, uh, as far as, I guess, like, ranking them best to worst, uh, I am not entirely sure. I kind of just have a soft spot for the original, um, but obviously 1 and 3 are like, what I think are probably uh, the best ones, with 5 kind of right there on the outskirts, which would have been... With more talented actors, probably would have been much better and more effective. Um, so I would probably say, like, one and three are right there together, then five, then two, and then you got four on the end. So, yeah. Um, so that's how I feel about that series. So uh, we're almost done with this horror thing. I'm going to squeeze out a little uh, Dario Argento video. Not like a filmography video, just another regular versus... Um, for two of his movies, and then that should be it for this, and then we're going to go into a different territory. So, yeah, so all the usual stuff is coming, reviews and shit, uh, <laughs> and verses and all that. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so I think until all that other stuff, I think that's it.